Hi everyone, welcome to Shift from Moves the Needle. I'm Kavita Pachu. And I'm Mike Kendall. We are the co-hosts for this podcast. At Shift, we hope to inspire you to make a difference by learning from top innovation leaders about how they are driving impact around the world. For today's show, we will be talking to Katie Hansen, Director of Product Management at Benefit Focus and learning how her company quickly adapted to providing affordable benefits for their customers during this global pandemic. Benefit Focus is a leading provider of benefits management solutions to help make it easy for consumers, insurance carriers, employers, suppliers and brokers to shop, enroll and manage their benefits. Before we jump in, I'd like to tell you about an offer from Move the Needle. In the next week, we are offering a free 30-minute coaching session to learn to use the customer problem Zoom tool. This powerful yet simple tool allows you to quickly zoom in to understand and identify how your customers' needs have changed during this crisis and ways to solve them. Nike, Roche, ING, and other leading companies have used this tool to identify new growth opportunities. Use the link at the bottom of the screen to sign up. And now I'd like to welcome our guest, Katie Hansen, Director of Product Management at Benefit Focus, a leader in employee benefit solutions. Katie is a consumer experience thought leader and trained innovation catalyst. For almost two decades, she has helped consumers navigate big financial decisions and technology. Her passion for using data to uncover insights and foster innovation has contributed to advancement of consumer-centric solutions at market-leading companies like Wells Fargo, Renovate America, Intuit, and Global Analytics. Katie currently leads innovation, vision, and strategy for Benefit Focus's flagship product. Welcome, Katie. Thanks so much for joining us. Great. Thanks for having me. So we would assume that uh, when the pandemic hit, there was probably an all hands on deck approach, I'm guessing at Benefits Focus. And I uh, wondered if you could maybe open uh, the, the sort of the portal for us to understand what happened there for you and your team as you tried to best serve your customers. Yeah, I, I, you know, if I think back really to the February timeframe, it's like we saw the tidal wave coming, but you're, you're not quite sure when it's going to crash, right? As we saw it kind of move across Europe. Um, and so when it, when it started hitting here in the U.S., actually Washington State was hit, if we recall, with that nursing home. And that's actually one of our clients. Uh, so it, it got real, really fast. And the all hands on deck for us first started with being grounded in our principles. We, we use data and technology to deliver the right benefits to the right people at the right time. And so that really was enduring um, and making sure that the benefit experience can help people live their best life. And so all hands on deck for us was first off of what data are we gonna need and what's gonna change? What's gonna change with what are the right benefits first off? Who are the right people to connect with and what is the right time? And so we sort of had to think about completely different use cases uh, for our end users, the people on our platform, and then every single one of our stakeholders. And, and so all hands on deck, essentially, um, within our portals and our different communication tools, we sort of had different themes that we set up. So we could brainstorm, we could share articles, we could share hypothesis, we could, you know, when we talk to a client and we learn something new, uh, we could add that in and come up with ideas. Uh, and then there was a new series of different cadence of meetings so that we could focus on each one of our stakeholders and what might be different that we needed to provide to them based on the data we were seeing um, and then based on the, the shift in their need. So uh, it was taking a lot of skills and principles that are just part of our business, but it was completely solving it with, with new problems and problems that we couldn't even foresee coming until, until they sort of hit. Yeah, I love the bias for action. It sounds like you guys were, were quickly uh, pivoting and learning and trying to move at the uh, speed of light if you could. Um, were you also dealing with, uh, at that same time, moving everybody to working from home? Or was that something you're already doing sort of as a part of the way you normally work? 
So the first challenge we had is we had an event called One Place Scheduled for that, I think it was, what, it would have been the week right after St. Patrick's Day. So right when everything was hitting here in South Carolina. So we had a local on-site event that we normally would have the largest number of clients, a couple thousand people coming to Charleston, that we first had to pivot that. We had to think about, well, that, you know, certainly as a benefits company, we, having 2,000 people fly locally and, and obviously given the change in policies, um, we first had to problem solve that because we had some really valuable content about our company and the benefits in general that actually was very relevant for the time. So our first pivot was actually to, to go digital and we you know, took that content. Uh, we luckily have a video media studio within our company and we recorded everything over a weekend um, before we were all completely on lockdown. So that was our first step of equipping ourselves to have some tools and technology that we could use. And then essentially while we were holding the virtual conference is when we were all beginning to go remote. And so that was about problem solving. Some of us had the tools, I, you know, I can work from home in, in the role that I have. And so uh, for me, I had the tools and the technology, but we did have to really go department by department and understand who already had the authentication to say VPN to something or the security and we're a global company. So we also had to think about other countries and protocol sure. and our teams in India, our teams in Manila. And I would say those are some of the most challenging ones because they did not previously work from home. And then the third piece was our call center. How do we keep supporting our clients and not have disruption in any sort of, you know, business um, continuity uh, and, and make sure that we could have those, those team members work, work remotely. I will say living in a place where we get hurricanes and we regularly have to evacuate and, and kind of sort of, sort of implement our business continuity plans. We perhaps were more prepared than companies who don't live in a place like that, that, you know, the last two years I've had to evacuate and actually we've had to do it in the fall, which is open enrollment time. So it's kind of like we had a little bit of a practice. Cr crisis <laughs> management <say>. DNA. <laughs> Yeah. Now the longevity, I think, is a little bit different. So managing that, um, as well as the personal implications for everyone's life and children, and and um, making sure leaders in the company had empathy and how to approach that. Um, and then, unfortunately, um, you know, the recent news last week, we did actually have some layoffs. So moving through that process of expense reduction, I think a lot of companies are experiencing as well. I think you want to cut early and, and cut big on travel or other expenses um, before it certainly, um, you know, devastates your yeah. company. That was another yeah. thing that certainly we went through was our own personal, not only helping our clients, but really making sure that our own um, books and things like that were set up. So what would maybe if you thought about the one or two big, I know it's still a little bit early in this, but we've all learned so much, it seems like, in, in such a short amount of time. Any lessons learned that uh, if you kind of rewound your uh, self in time and said, man, I wish I had known this or I wish we were re more ready for this, that you might um, either, you know, say, hey, I wish we could have done this or maybe it'll help folks that are still struggling with that. Hmm. that that's an interesting one. I think... Um, I think it's just being comfortable with change. I think that's something we all can always get better. We like our routines. We like things predictable. And yeah. in this instance where none of us chose the change, the most important I think is the human element. So if I look at what I did first is, you know, I did not miss a single one-on-one -on -one with any of my employees. I prioritized that first checking in with them, making sure they were personally okay uh and and then working on them professionally and i think you know one of the messages from our ceo was take care of yourself first and then we'll take care of our clients and i definitely think of it like when you take an airplane flight you know put your own mask on first before you put your child's <laughs> that i think that's one of the biggest lessons um you know we talk about self-care being very popular these days and you know mental wellness and all that we have to take care of ourselves before we can take out take care of other people and, and I think now more than ever, that's been a, a good reminder for me, um, taking care of my team, taking care of the people in my household, just making sure that everyone's in the right state of mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I even look at the you know, restaurant business, right? The ones that are doing well are the ones that have taken care of their patrons and, and treated them well, taking care of their employees, who I think are thriving in the takeout and still kind of making things work. That just the refocus on people and the human element 
maybe it's one of the biggest um, kind of reminders for me. We uh, would kind of love to hear, I've heard that you're kind of a, taking on a second job now that schools are virtual and you're doing some teaching of your, of your kid. And uh, so I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about that and how you're balancing uh, that new role with uh, your ongoing uh, work at Benefit Focus. Yeah, so the, the last eight weeks have been a little bit different. Um, we actually decided to what we call quarantine with my neighbor. Uh, so in the mornings, I have three kids in the house and I'm the kind of math and science teacher for the most part. And then the lunch lady, of course, midday. And then they typically go to my neighbors in the afternoon where she does more of the art and PE and, and whatever's left. So it's totally different routine than we had eight weeks ago. Um, obviously no commute, but getting used to the constant multitasking of questions and uh, trying to make sure everyone has food uh, that's healthy and not some sort of frozen meal. Uh, it's a little bit different. Yeah, wow, I'm kind of in awe. That's, <laughs> I can't even imagine. Um, is I assume you went through some sort of experimentation to kind of get into a rhythm over the last few weeks or? Yeah, you know, I feel like the first couple of weeks were all about like survive. And for me, survive means structure, like having a clear plan for the day. Right. Uh, but every day, if I think the plan changed, like we tried to plan and then that didn't work. And then schoolwork changed and a new plan and a new plan. But we're kind of in a good groove now. We, we have a set time when we start. We kind of everyone has a list and they have their own checklist so they can self-manage their time. We all eat lunch at the same time you know, afternoon is more free time. So now we're kind of in a, a good cadence, but it did take some experimenting with too much structure than not enough structure. And I think the most important part is when the kids know exactly what they need to accomplish and they can be accountable for doing it, it seems to work a little bit better. Yeah, I'm going to fly you here once uh, we're flying again to uh, organize our cul-de-sac because there seem to be kids running wild and uh, I'm like, they, they need some structure around here. That's what they do. The kids, when they're at, at my house, they call it Katie school. So it's, <laughs> yeah, no it. messing with Katie school, right? <laughs> no, they don't like, and yeah, I'm curious about it. Yeah. That's, so, you know, that's our, awesome. all our social media feeds are full with everybody trying to, you know, play teacher at home and um, asking for tips. So uh, what, you know, what tips would you have for our listeners who are actually about like you balancing, teaching their kids, keeping them motivated to learn, and of course, a full-time job? Well, I kind of had to go back and rely on some of my, my, my first job out of, school, out of college was working at a place called SCORE, which is an educational center, part of Kaplan. And so I, I have a little bit of maybe teacher blood in me, although clearly I departed from that career uh, for a reason. I think one of the biggest things to remember, and actually this is a lesson from today, is it's more important for them to learn the concept than it is for them to finish the work. Uh, so, you know, one of the kids I was helping today, converting feet to inches, she was just struggling and it was just not working. She was so focused on just getting the answers done and just getting done with that assignment. I said, forget it. We're not doing it today. It's not the right time. We're going to do it tomorrow. Uh, and I think for me, remembering that anytime things get challenging is if they're not learning the concept, take a pause. Like, because the point in the whole thing is to learn the concept. It's not to complete the assignment. And I think that's where I think a lot of parents perhaps are struggling is they get this long list and, but we didn't accomplish item nine. And then they feel like a failure for the whole day. You know what, if your kid learned a couple new concepts today, that's great. And maybe he'll learn a couple other ones later. But if they also finished all nine things and didn't learn anything, you know, one day Cooper finished all of his work early and, and he wanted to cook something and, and I want him to do half the recipe. And so I made him actually convert everything by 50%, all the measurements. And I was like, this is a great assignment. Um, so I just think maybe having a different perspective on what learning looks like uh, and maybe teaching them a different skill than the teacher assigned is, is okay right now. Uh, and then just cutting and calling it quits if, if they're not mentally ready to handle it. Yeah, that makes sense. So basically, you know, instead of um, driving for results, you're really solving for outcomes <clears throat> and yeah. basing it based on the kid's learning style, right? That makes absolutely, sense. absolutely. And then I think the, the one tip that at least works for all of my kids, like I said, is they all have a clipboard. They look at their day, they can decide, they can start with whatever subject they want. And most of them tend to start with a subject they hate, um, which is funny, uh, uh, or I guess like the least. 
but it just learned teaching them that independence, I think is very freeing for me. Uh, two of the three were not independent at all. Uh, when we started this whole new new way of life and now they they do they look they're listening like i have four more okay and they can kind of piece themselves even mentally it's like what we do in our day right we look at our calendar we see our meetings we think about what we need to accomplish we mentally gear up for those things we don't want to do um and then we kind of power through yeah that makes sense that's pretty neat that's pretty neat would you be willing to send a picture of your clipboard to oh, share sure. with our listeners yeah, actually, uh, I have a whole PowerPoint I could send you of all their different little pages. And, uh, and we actually, it includes our grocery list too. We have a set grocery list with checklist because Nate now does the grocery shopping, which he hates. And he has pictures of all the new items that he has to go <laughs> find in the grocery store. So yeah, I, can, I would happy, happily share our list and our to-do list. Thank you. I'm sure our listeners would love that. <laughs> So is the metric system uh, on tap for next week now that you've got the Imperial measurements yeah. down? Actually, we started with the metric system. You and did. We went to, uh, it's easier, yeah. right? It, it actually is a lot easier than the feet to yards. and, and yeah, It's, that's <laughs> it's just more symmetrical, right? It makes, I don't know, for some reason. Yeah, I, I kind of wish we would convert our country. Exactly. Yeah. So I grew up in Kate, learning the metric system. <laughs> and learning it we were i think it was hawaii we were there a few years ago and they had uh kilometer signs on the road and i thought oh, that's interesting and they finally took them away i guess it was too confusing for the the americans the we're driving 100 miles an hour <laughs> yeah right right the, they didn't have the speed limits set up that way but unfortunately you know uh, during this shelter in place we are all spending a lot of time with our family i think something uh, i can say most of us have never done right whether it's our partner spouse or kids mm -hmm. so what's something new you have learned about your family during this crisis yeah so gosh for us it, it is a drastic transition because like i said we're, we're quarantining with our neighbor so we went from kind of having three only children, my child, Nate's child, and her child, to this blended family where they have siblings. And I think the most important thing we've probably learned is just talking things out. We've had a couple of family meetings where we had to just get a lot of stuff on the table and we're, you know, be able to say we're not happy about this and none of us want this. We want you to go to school. You want to go to school and, and really talk out the stress and the pressures. And then same thing, even the dynamics between the two households and the three kids. Um, we had a quarantine meeting last Friday to talk about their stresses and how they get on each other's nerves and how to work through those emotions. Uh, and I think out of most of those meetings is just everyone needs an understanding of maybe when they need a little bit of quiet time or when they need to remove themselves from the situation or go play by themselves or listen to music by themselves. And I don't think we ever really had to talk about that before or like plan that time you know I, I used to get alone time in my car right driving to work or alone time even alone time at the grocery store when i could when i was allowed to go grocery shopping and so i think for the first time we've had to more deliberately communicate about how we're feeling about things and had to learn how we make our own space and our own time to sort of recharge and, and get off of each other's nerves that makes sense that makes total sense you know, uh, you're so right. There is no time to decompress because uh, you don't have those commutes. Mm -hmm. right? So I also believe you love to cook. I do. And, and most of us are cooking a lot at home these days. I know my dishwasher, I don't believe has ever been used as much as it's been in the past six to eight weeks. Yeah. So um, what's been, you know, What's been, uh, have you tried anything new? Do you have a favorite quarantine recipe that you'd like to share with us? Ooh, I have tried. So I actually, you know, went old school a little bit at the beginning of the quarantine and busted out some old cookbooks, you know, those actual books with the pages, not just uh, Googling and, and looking on tasty.com. And so we did, we tried some new recipes, some, some that we like to kind of some new salad ideas. I think trying to eat healthy in this time has been important, not just our comfort foods and um, so some new salads with some new dressing and like feta dressing and some beets and um, so that's been fun and also because we combine households trying new recipes that I hadn't had before my neighbors I think our 
Well, I'd maybe two things. So we have, um, I think it's called a sous vide. I don't know if you've ever cooked in the water with the heating. It's a mm -hmm. French way of cooking. That has been a lifesaver for us because you can throw chicken in there, you can throw meat. And so ribs in the sous vide has been a um, hands down winner. But I think the other one is we do tachos. So tater tot nachos. So it's uh, the tater tots and then we make like a white queso and then we do some pulled pork. Uh, and you can put salsa on there, and that's probably our most popular kind of comfort dive in. And there's you know, a restaurant yeah. concept in that one, I think, <laughs> or a food truck. Yeah, when when Nate came home with the groceries last week, we were like, "Oh, you want more tater tots? We can make tachos." <laughs> <laughs> The pandemic has brought about massive uncertainty and change for everyone. What experience from your past have helped you professionally and even maybe personally? So professionally, I think, you know, being in product management, we are natural problem solvers. I think um, a trait that we all have is we can look at something that maybe looks like chaos and really try to distill what's going on and what's the root issue. And I think that skill, both personally and professionally, has been helpful. So, you know, when things are blowing up on a particular day at home, I can say like, okay, what's going on? Is it, is it stress? Is it like, is it somebody hungry? Somebody forgot to have lunch? Uh, and then at work, the same thing. I think the problems we've been dealing with our clients that we were dealing with, you know, six months ago, are completely different than the problems we're dealing with now but the approach is the same you know listening to them asking good questions you know getting to the heart of what outcomes they're trying to drive and what's preventing them from doing that and then working to provide the tools or the information to help them accomplish that and so i think you know personally and professionally just being able to ask questions be a listener honestly write problem statements, <laughs> then write your hypothesis and, and know what success looks like is just kind of a rinse and repeat, morning, noon, and night. Um, it's kind of what I do every single day, all day. Can you give us a specific example of maybe, you know? Um, so okay. professionally, a big shift for us, I mean, you know, at Benefit Focus, our, our whole purpose is to use benefits to help people live a better life. And so as we work with health plans or brokers or employers or the people who use our platform, that's the focus of everything we do. And prior to the pandemic, what a better life looked like or the factors that people were using to make decisions were completely different. And so now an example of that is we, you know, we had a call probably seven weeks ago now with a large employer uh, in, in the restaurant industry who had to lay off 17,000 people uh, that is, that's not something that I think they ever thought would have happened, or they certainly never want to do. And so as they think as, as an employer of how do we mitigate our risks financially of people who might be sick and, and certainly have a burden on our, our health plan if they're self-insured, how do we gracefully lay off such a huge workforce at such a difficult time and, you know, emotionally the people dealing with it as well as the people who are receiving the bad news, as well as plan that hoping at some point they can hire at least some, if not all of them back. Like, that's an example where we had to just explore new problems that nobody's embarked on before. Nobody's had to lay off that amount of people so quickly um, and, and, and just the complexities that come with that. And then on the flip side of things, you know, we also have clients that this has been a powerful opportunity for them. You know, we actually have a, gro a large grocery delivery company that immediately exploded and then had different issues of how do they hire and how do they onboard and how do they do that remotely and how do they keep their workforce safe and how do they actually kind of capitalize on this as a revenue opportunity. So both sides of the spectrum, you know, we, we really had to solve and get creative and really brainstorm together. We can bring the ideas to the table, they can bring the ideas to the table and then figure out how we could use our technology or our platform or the information or even the connections we have to make it happen. That makes sense. And so uh, did you conduct interviews? Did you, how did you kind of do a deeper dive to listen to them and understand and identify their needs? So, Interviews makes it sound so formal. <laughs> I mean, it was honestly like Zoom calls and WebEx calls of like, what are you going through? What's the next thing you have to accomplish in the next 24 hours? You know, what are you stressed about? What's going on? So I, I guess you could call it an interview, but it was honestly just picking up the phone. We were having calls with our clients. 
we were trying to say, wow, like this segment seems really similar, like the restaurant and retail industry was certainly was having similar challenges um, versus those companies who were already either accustomed to working remote. Um, you know, they had very different challenges. And then we have the ones, uh, you know, like the grocery stores and things as such where um, the, the need for them and the demand completely changed. So we were able to talk to people, but we did not have like a set interview schedule and asking them the same questions and no time for necessarily um, formal synthesis of quantitative data. We kind of had to just roll with the punches and um, learn on the fly. No, totally. I think when I meant interviews was did you, were you able to reach out to them and understand okay. because, you know, this is a busy time for them also. And I think it was more, they may not have even have the time to meet with you. So I think that's yeah. great that you were able to do that and, uh, you know, get a sense, listen to them and get a sense of their needs. Right? The other thing we did do is, is we knew we were a hub for a massive amount of information that could be helpful. So we also actually stood up a website for them that brought so much of the information together. We were particularly focused on uh, benefit administrators and employers. Uh, we knew that, I mean, that was gonna be an impossible task for any one benefit administrator to sweep the whole market, right? And know every piece of information and aggregate it. So that is a service that we did start providing we, we launched a website and then we could watch the metrics you know who who was coming in who was actually visiting it where were they coming from what were they clicking on um, and then we have that still today where we were um, it's a great resource for like I said particularly targeted towards benefit administrators um, and added service so that they had a, a wealth of, of resources right at their fingertips and how are you using that um, I you said you had all the you know the data to who's using it but how are you then using that data now well, certainly looking and watching on what was helpful. We also hosted um, a couple webinars on the topics that seemed to be most important. Um, so one of those topics was what are the benefits I should be adding or providing to my employees that maybe I didn't have or think about before. So like a doctor's on demand or telehealth, right? Those are important or prescription delivery and the importance of that. Um, and then, you know, another one on how to sort of pivot some of your um, support for your employees, right? If they're working remote, what might you provide them that you weren't thinking about before? The mental health and wellness um, that obviously is so important today. So we use the data to think about, to, to find out what topics were um, most relevant or kind of had the biggest gap. You know, you can't just go read an article and have your plan all buttoned up. Sometimes it requires that conversation. So that led into some webinars. And then um, it certainly triggered more conversations with our clients. You know, we certainly have that door open. Um, any of them that wanted to talk or problem solve or, or leverage our resources. Uh, and then the third thing that it actually launched is we did actually coach and help, unfortunately, many of our companies lay off tens of thousands of people. We actually launched uh, a new website called um, benefitplace.com where those people who had lost their benefits from their employer could actually go and log on and get access to many of those same benefits. Not all of them, of course, are subsidized in the same way that maybe they were previously for their employer. Um, but the, the one portal access to the benefit, that concept, making sure that those employees can maintain them even when they're not employed with a hope that those employers can hire them back on. And there's a, there's a level of, of um, kind of keeping things consistent um, between the employee experience and the benefits that they had access to and keeping some consistency with what they have now. So that's the other thing that we did with that information. Did you find that that was a delighter for those employers that really had compassion, you know, wanted to make sure they could do as much as they could for those folks? Yeah, I mean, I think we're in that time where if we can help out a neighbor or a person in our life, we do, whether that's, you know, cooking banana bread and delivering it to just the person down the street or buying a couple extra groceries. And I think it it was devastating for so many employers and the Ben admins and, and gut wrenching. I mean, just so emotional to have to, to, to lay off that many people that I do think there was a sense of peace and comfort where they could, you know, give them some tools and some resources, you know, go beyond some of the traditional of say Cobra and unemployment and those sorts of things. Sure. Um, so yeah, I think, I think even mentally there was a peace of mind and that's helpful. And like I said, we, we wanted to sort of offboard them very softly and then ideally onboard them back on as, as the tide turns too. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. I think that this time everyone is looking for, uh, looking for a compassionate way to uh, treat people and people who are uh, going, I mean, going through 
hardship are looking for compassion and understanding. So mm -hmm. I'm sure the employees appreciated that portal that you all actually stood up, you know. Yeah, and I think there's an opportunity ongoing. I think that's the maybe one of the beauties of the pandemic, the things we're learning and the lessons we're learning and the tools that we can even keep. Like, you know, we we can keep that forever, right? We're always going to have an ebb and flow of employees and people who are either laid off or quit or, you know, are terminated for whatever reason. And, you know, let's, we kind of created the smooth path and we're certainly going to keep that and continue to build that out further. Based on your experience, uh, what, you know, during this, you know, moment of massive change, uh, what are some of the teachable moments that uh, you can share with our listeners? Mm. So the teachable moments for me, I think, just go back to grounding in some of my professional training, right? Which is um, ask the whys, right? Why, 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 why is this going on? Why are you feeling this? Why, why are you experiencing it? Like, just kind of be curious um, before you jump to conclusions. I think that's that's a, a, a big lesson learned and, and a reminder that's been instilled. And then making sure that you're really focused on solving the root issue um, is another tool I've definitely used. So in something like this, where this isn't like a rinse repeat kind of moment, right? These last two months in no way have been normal. Um, but if I can fall back to know that I'm focused on the right problems and that I have the right priorities uh, and that I have the data to show it, then I can feel confident that I'm moving myself, my team and my actions in the right direction. So uh, a lot of it just goes back to kind of the the product management training that I've had and, and relying on my skills to just solve the new problems. And what would be, so that makes sense. I think uh, building on what you just said, uh, what would be, um, as a leader, uh, what would be your um, advice to other leaders in terms of uh, managing a crisis and how to um, help and support your people? Yes, I think, you know, it's meeting people where they are, as I think of like the, the very diverse one on one conversations I've had, you know, some people show up and they've, you know, they're showered and dressed and they're ready to go and they're just on board and they're like, it's going to be a great work week and other people like can't get it together right like just it's just not happening today and so i think um you know starting all the conversations and even i think of the team meetings now where you used to be in person and chit chat and you say how's your weekend like doing that on a call and just checking in with people how is your day going no like really really how is your day going today um and and being curious and and then being flexible um, you know, I, th I, many of my team members have said, like, I, I just, I need to go offline for the afternoon. And, and so rather than being like, well, what do you mean? We have that really important meeting and right? being like, okay, then you know what, if that's what you need and you know what you need, go offline. Um, you know, one of the themes of my team meeting today was working from home is different. And that might mean for some people working from 3am to 6am because they're awake and they can't sleep and Gratefully, their children are sleeping, so they're going to work. Um, and then maybe they're going to take a long lunch between 11 and 2.30 because that's what they need to do. So I think as a leader, it's just meeting people where they are, um, emotionally connecting with them as human beings, and then just being really flexible and not trying to institute the same structure um, or have the same expectations we had before because the, before is not now. True. And it's I think not going to be them, for quite some I time. see a common theme about giving them space, right? And there's a lot of trust. I think if I think about what that looks like, that's trust, right? We hire people to do a job with a specific outcome. We don't hire them to sit in front of a computer for a certain number of hours. And so if I can show that I trust them, that they're going to make the choices throughout, you know, a day and a week and a month to accomplish their job, um, I think that leads to a happier employee who's actually going to do a much better job um, as opposed to saying, you know, why aren't you on my 8 a.m. call? And you're two minutes late right i think you're so right i think trust is so important right now i you know i was in a meeting with uh, some leaders uh yesterday and one of the things that they mentioned was like now is the time to trust everyone if you're not going to be able to trust people you're not going to be able to get anything done so it's not mm -hmm. it's an it's imperative right Mm -hmm. exactly. And I think before there was a lot of stigma on the work from home. I know some companies adopted it better than others. I think 
Benefit Focus had good aspirations of uh, work from home policy before, but the reality is, is the people working from home, they were always like, why are you working from home today? Uh, and now I think it's proven, you know, our business has not taken a blip, like everyone's working, we're definitely producing, you know, things are not falling through the cracks. And so I think we can use that to show that we really can trust everybody. Um, and hopefully after this, you know, the work from home expectations or policy or um, flexibility will continue to be there without the stigma. Right, right. Yeah, I, I love I what, um, oh, sorry, I was just going to jump in and said, I love that you um, are asking the question, how are you really? Um, that may be a tough conversation for some leaders that haven't gone there before with their employees to be emotionally that present and, and vulnerable, but I think it's really a best practice when you have to rely on people that are not in an office and have a lot of competing priorities because they're trying to balance a lot of things at home, or maybe they're by themselves or in a an apartment in New York and they're going crazy because they, they're an extrovert and, and they, they need somebody to talk to and to listen to them. Yeah, and part of being a good manager, I think, is is helping them solve their whole life. You know, I was on a call with one of my employees this week who her husband was laid off. And so we actually, mm -hmm. part of our time, talked about like, well, you know, who do I know on LinkedIn or what does he want to do? And I actually connected him to, you know, somebody that I know here locally to potentially have a job. And, and part of some of that as a manager is helping them solve other parts of their life so that they can show up to work and be a better person. Um, and that's something, you know, throughout my career, I found helpful. I, I can think of another employee this year where, um, you know, financially she wanted to save for a house and really couldn't figure out how to do that. And so we worked on her budget and you know what, that didn't have anything to do with work, but she bought a house and she will, she does show up as a better employee now because we're solving her whole life and not just the working hours of our life. And, and I think that's more true now than ever. Um, and I look at that as part of my role as their leader and manager is to help them with, with life and not just their job. Yeah, that makes, that makes total sense. You know, remember, uh, I think uh, there is a saying that goes bringing your whole self to work, mm -hmm. right? And that's what it's about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, we were talking about, okay, you know, a lot of change, right? Um, the cust your customers' needs have changed, your employees' needs have changed, the way we're working has changed. Um, and we're all, we're planning for, at least right now, we're planning for the now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my question for you is, um, at, you know, how is benefit focus balancing planning, understanding what's now and what's going to stay this way? for a longer time and then planning for solving for now, plan planning for, you know, the six month period and maybe even beyond. Can you sort of share that a little bit? Yeah, I think, you know, if our company maybe skews towards planning the now better. Um, and I think that probably varies by company. Some companies maybe are, you know, have their great three to five year plan and that's just where their their mindset is and other people are in the here and now. I'd say for the most part, because we, we do live in a benefits world, the here and now is easy for us, right? We got problems, we got clients, they need us, they need a conversation, we need to get a solution, we gotta have it today or tomorrow or 24 hours, 48 hours. Like that's what we're good at. I do think it's stretching us a little bit on how to make sure we're making the right investments for the next wave that's coming um, and making the choice between the short, the short and the long term. I look at, we, you know, we just did a cycle of our investment prioritization for our, our technology teams and it definitely skews towards the immediate which makes me a little bit nervous as opposed to thinking about well what are those needs when they're going to be emerging when there's going to be massive hiring probably that's going to hopefully come back again there's going to be a change in spending habits you know i even know me personally i'm spending many different just because of the uncertainty um how are we solving that you know which which of our products maybe are going to you know not do as well um given the shifts and i i think um we need, we're, we need to shift more to the six to 12 to 24 months, but I feel like we're still in survival mode that we're not quite to how to thrive in the new environment yet where we're, we're still probably making that transition. And I think to do that, we, we probably could look to some other countries who maybe are a little bit farther along or go back in history and look at comparable situations um, or frankly, lock out the time to do the brainstorming and 
come up with some hypothesis or what we think is going to go on or what we think is going to happen. And we, we kind of haven't, to be honest with you, probably done that enough yet. What would be the business justification in your, uh, you know, opinion to um, make sure you are able to balance the short, which is the now and the urgency of the now with at least the short term? Yeah, you know, I look at a lot of the now is putting us in protection mode, um, you know, making sure we're protecting our assets, protecting our resources and keeping the boat afloat. But the future to me, you know, as a business, you want to capitalize this as an opportunity. And so how do you change something that um, you, you didn't maybe sign up for into, you know, making the lemonade out of lemon sort of a situation. And so um, the quicker we can get out of survival mode, I think the stronger we will come out of it. We have had conversations certainly around how can we leverage some, you know, competitive differentiation in this market and, you know, how can some of our competitors are much smaller than we are, so they don't have access to the resources we do to sustain. So how can we use that as a leverage point, right? Um, we have more data in the industry than anybody else. So how do we use that in a better way? So I think we've had the conversation, but as you were mentioning earlier, earlier, Mike, when all this was hitting, action, 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 action on the immediate was, is our go-to and that's our strong muscle. Um, and, and so it's like, how do we have the same urgency with something that's not going to have the impact towards nine or 12 months? It's just, it's a muscle we have to remind ourselves of. Um, and as a leader, that's kind of part of my role, like asking those questions to my team. Great. You've got your backlog for now, but like, let's, let's think about a little bit farther out. Uh, and then certainly on the strategic leadership call I'm on, you know, making sure it's not 50 minutes of the here and now and 10 minutes of the future, but, you know, getting the agenda and the balance and the conversation and, and moving the needle on that too. You, you know, you kept uh, mentioning sort of in the middle of a lot of the stories you've shared with us, your, your values, your principles, um, your mission as an organization, it sounds like, and maybe I'm reading something into it, but it sounds like that's pretty well understood by most of your workforce and maybe is a good, strong foundation for these types of unplanned situations that you don't have to tell everybody every little thing to do. They have these guiding principles and they're going to make the decisions based on that true north. A hundred percent. I think successful organizations who have clear values can create that, you know, empower people in the organization to be thought leaders and to make the right choices. Um, one benefit we had, like I said, was our one place and, and going digital. That's our annual sort of company meeting that we reinforce our values. We re-talk about our values. Uh, you know, we talk about our mission and our purpose and why we're here. So in some ways, that, that virtual uh, conference kicked off essentially, you know, all the, the, the subsequent things that were happening. So I think we, we have that benefit um, that we're not having to spend time. Well, wait, how do we approach that situation? Well, what are our values first to then help us make the decision? You know, our company stood up something called We Care, uh, I think one week after all of this started, which was a way for our, our employees to contribute to a fund that then people could then apply for funds if their family is impacted negatively, right? And that was so obvious that we were going to do that because of some of our vision and principles and values and so things like that I think makes the immediate easier kind of building upon that because our values are so here and now um, and we're living and breathing them and it's just um, the farther out I think is just more of the challenge. A couple couple fun hopefully fun questions for you a little rapid fire uh, maybe that uh, you weren't expecting but uh, I hear you're a big uh, University of Southern California football fan and wondered <laughs> <laughs> if there are any lessons in leadership from sports that maybe we could apply in the situation that we're all going through now. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, well, I'm definitely devastated if we don't have college football this fall. That's going to be a... Me too. Terrible. I will say <laughs> that. Um, you know, I think a good analogy on a team is you have different players and those players all have different roles and they're fairly established roles. Um, but if you think about probably some of the greatest... Uh, plays in, in college history and or football history. Um, it's not always planned or it doesn't go as planned. It's those Hail Mary, somebody just goes for it and they're out of position, but you're making it happen and the teamwork that comes with it. And I think that is a really good analogy now is we can't just say like, this is my role and this is what I do. And this is, sorry, you're going to have to figure it out. Um, I think it's that time where 
the players shifted and you moved around and you knew where the goal was and everyone sort of rallies around it um, uh, to accomplish the goal. I, I kind of actually picture my team like that, right? Where we're kind of pivoting and shifting and you were working on this, but that doesn't make sense anymore. So let's go work on that. And if you could do that, cause you're really good at that move over here. Um, that's kind of what's happened in the last eight weeks is um, yeah. talented Agil people. Agility is a buzzword, but um, yeah. we're having to, to practice it now in real life and really feel what it's like. Like, so, okay. So another quick question for you, uh, two people, uh, that you would love to have dinner with and why mm. either separately so, or together. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm a big advocate of a big family meal. So I'd probably have them together, you know, two people I've really thought about and actually been even listening to some of their talks and podcasts and conversations recently are, um, Oprah, Oprah Winfrey and, and Barack Obama. I think Oprah, as you think of her life and the challenges she went through and the things she had to overcome, I really admire how she has invested in herself and kind of as a lifelong learner and, you know, always wants to learn and grow. And if there was ever a time to learn and grow, it's, it's through all of this. And so I feel like she'd have some good words of wisdom um, of how to change the negative to a positive and how to help help you grow in a, a time of challenge. And then if I look at leaders, um, you know, I think Barack Obama uses words in a powerful way that create change. I think he picked his words very carefully. I think anytime he speaks, he picks his words very carefully, but I bet he would have um, a good perspective on how, you know, I as a leader can use my role um, and you use my words to, um, create positive change. And so I would, I would love to have that dinner conversation with the two of them. Yeah. I think uh, you could probably do pay-per-view on that one, right? <laughs> with, with all of those folks together. Yeah. So a uh, last quick question for you. Uh, most unusual thing that we would find on your desk, either at the office or at your house. The most unusual thing. So interestingly enough, I'm fairly tidy at home and my desk is a disaster. Uh, but it's, it's organized chaos because it's, I mean, like any innovation catalyst, I feel like it's post-it notes everywhere, clustered in colors, um, and you have an affinitized desk. Yeah. And, and, and my challenge it's your is system and you understand it, right? <laughs> I would say my, my current desk is the kitchen table. And so you would find a sixth grader, a fourth grader and a third grader and lots of math equations. Uh, like if anyone remembers the please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, that was on the table today, along with coffee. But um, on a normal day, it's, it's lots of post-it notes um, and organized chaos of those post-it notes. But okay. no, well, um, ben Blank, one of our guests, uh, had mushroom tea on his desk, and I didn't hear that on your desk, so uh, I guess I we'll... Have Cholula. That is my, my go-to hot sauce that goes on everything, and it does... Awesome. Mm -hmm. Spice it up. That's great. So, <laughs> so that's, that comes from your California. That's my California. <laughs> yeah, definitely adopted that when I moved to San Diego, and it, it followed me here to Charleston, South Carolina. Nice, nice. So, you know, we've talked so much about how you as a leader are helping your people, how you were, you know, you got everyone together to serve your customers. And, you know, in this time, we are, you know, we are all going through, we all go through feeling hopeful and then moments of despair, right? What I want to ask you is how do you keep yourself motivated? Gosh, um, short goals help me. So I do have a little chart that I make and I have daily and kind of weekly things, just a few things each day that I want to accomplish. And I think accomplishing little things that I'm, I'm confident I can do helps me feel like I'm making progress and that I'm not underwater or um, you know, that the problems aren't too big that I can't solve them. And then I think you know, the other thing is I've always had a motto in my life of kind of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So when something's tough, there can always be a lesson learned, um, something good that can come out of it. Um, 
uh, I personally have been probably drinking more wine than I used to. And I, I remember going to the wineries up in Napa and them saying the most fruitful vines of the best grapes for wine are the ones that have weathered lots of storms, who didn't have the perfect amount of water, who, you know, had the heat and the snow and the storm. And so I, I sort of look at some of the challenges either daily or with the pandemic or just when life gets hard of being able to say this is a storm you got to weather and it makes you stronger and at the end uh at the end of it it will hopefully make you more fruitful um because of what you went through so i think for me i try to share that also with my team of something good will come out of this problem and it will it will only make us better thank you that is very profound and beautiful katie so thank you so much for joining us today this was wonderful. It was a pleasure to have you. And I'm sure our listeners will be able to take what you've shared and create impact in their lives and for their customers. If I was to summarize the three takeaways uh, from what you've shared with us today, one is really bringing about positive change, being compassionate and by asking, how are you really doing, right? Uh, not in this time more than ever, but in general, right? Mm -hmm. Second is go deep, understand, and listen to your customers, right? Mm -hmm. And the third, I think I heard was about, uh, you know, quick wins. So go narrow and keep yourself motivated by accomplishing small, manageable things so that you feel like you are making progress and you're in control. Yeah, those are all great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think uh, one more thing that uh, we took away were the tachos. So yeah. we're looking forward oh, to yeah. that. Recipe. I'll get you the tachos. Those are going in the rotation. So. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Awesome. Well, I would like to remind our audience that we have a 30 minute free coaching session available to you for the next week. So all you have to do is go out to our website. We are going to be covering uh, what we call the customer problem zoom. This is going to help you understand in these times of crisis what the problems are that your customers are having that maybe were different now than they were before and help you get to breakthrough solutions. Also stay tuned for our next episode. We're going to have Steve Portugal join us. He's an author, speaker, and customer research expert. He's going to be sharing with us how to drive innovation using strategic power of customer insights. And I think you'll find especially interesting with him uh, how he goes beyond just interviewing and helping you make an impact to get your ideas uh, heard and, and implemented. So don't miss that. And don't forget to take advantage of Moves and Needles existing resources on thriving during uncertain times at movestheneedle.com. Thanks again, Katie. You were awesome. We loved having you as a guest. And we want to invite everybody listening to be well and to lead the shift.